All right, guys, welcome to tonight's Royalty Movement Team Training. If you don't know who we are, we are Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Smith. And we are located in North Little Rock, Arkansas, guys. And we are the creators of the Royalty Movement. We established this movement when we joined my econ. It's been almost 10 years, almost 10 years ago since um, we created this powerful movement. And it was just, we joined my econ because we were interested in leveling up our finances, fixing our credit, and just getting on the right track. And we became very, very passionate about it. We knew so many people that could benefit from family members to friends to just people on social media. We knew so many people, especially in our community, needed this. And so we turned it into just like a complete movement so that we can empower as many people as we possibly can. And here we are. So tonight we are going over the My Credit System. That is the name of our do-it-yourself credit repair system that is included in your My Econ membership. I'm about to turn my camera off and I'm going to share my screen. Let me know if you can see my screen. Give me a moment. And I don't know why I do this. I should have had up the website already. Give me a moment. Recording in progress. All right. So let me know if you can see the My Econ website. Put me a number five in the chat if you can see my screen. Can everybody see it? Can everybody still hear me? Put a five in the chat. There we go. I see those fives. All right. Thank you, guys. Now, everybody should be familiar with this website. When you join my econ, you received an email with your very own website that looks identical to this. Okay. It has your name, your own password. Guys, it's yours. Log in as much as possible. I promise you, you cannot break anything. I say dive in and really give it your all and you can see amazing results with this company just as we have. If you look at the top, there is a carousel here, okay? You see all of these different things from investment education to correcting your W-4, our travel membership, which is optional. You can upgrade if you want discounted travel, um, the My Credit System, I'll come right back to that, debt elimination, Minimizing your taxes, our cash flow manager, which is a record keeping software for tracking all of your business expenses, not just with my econ, but any other business that you may have. And it's included in your membership, y'all. And then we have our cash flow strategist. Now, I know you're looking at all of this like, well, that's a lot. Where do I start? Don't worry. We have it broken down in baby steps on the royaltymovement.com. That is our training website theroyaltymovement.com. We take you step-by-step step through all of those things. I know you probably just came in for credit repair. I know you may have came in for, you know, something else, maybe making money. I say, since you got access to everything, take full advantage of everything. Even if you don't take advantage of the business side of my econ, you don't want to make money, at least get your finances in order. Kings and Queens, get all of that together. Give yourself a pay raise on your job. Find out your debt freedom date, how much money you need to comfortably retire, right? You can set up a financial plan for yourself. Um, the investment education, because as our mentor stated, if you don't have money working for you, you are not even on the road to becoming wealthy. You will literally be chasing a dollar, guys. And that's, listen, I don't want to work until I die. And I don't want anybody associated with this movement to work until they die. However... Over 60, 70% of Americans do work until they die. They cannot retire comfortably because why? They don't have the money. They didn't have financial literacy. They didn't have money management. And here you are with all of this at your fingertips. Apply, 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 okay? Let's go into the My Credit System, okay? The My Credit System, let's give it a second to low here. As you can see on the left-hand side, it's only a total of 24 minutes. A total of 24 minutes. Yeah. Less than uh, a sitcom, right? Less than a show on Netflix. 
The intro video, as you can see, is only 30 seconds long. Um, let's scroll up. Step number one is pulling your credit report. Uh-oh. Yeah, I couldn't figure out how to take that off the screen the last time. Like seeing people in the top corner. I don't know how to remove that. <laughs> but it's okay. We'll just leave Anisha up there. Uh, step number one is pulling your credit report. As you can see, it is only two minutes long, guys. This video is going to teach you how to pull your credit report. Underneath the video are a couple of links, annualcreditreport.com. It tells you that this website provides free credit reports. MyFICO.com, this website provides credit report from all three of the main credit bureaus, as well as your FICO score. So you watch the video and then follow the steps that it gives you, okay? Watch the video and follow the steps. I highly, highly, highly recommend you do not skip any steps, okay? I know you may think that you only need to dispute a couple of items on your credit report and that's it. I'm telling you right now, that's not it. You need more than that. There's five factors that make up your score and disputing is only one part of the process, okay? You have to understand how your overall score works. Step number two is freezing secondary bureaus. Some people have no clue what this step is all about. As you can see, the video is only two minutes and 53 seconds. Before you begin any type of dispute on your credit report, you want to freeze the secondary bureaus. These are the secondary consumer reporting agencies that contain like a lot of your personal information. They get a lot of your data to verify your credit, right? And the information comes from the big three bureaus, Equifax, Experian, TransUnion. So this one is a very, very instrumental, uh, instrumental step in your dispute process. More people successfully get things removed from their credit report when they go through this freeze. Again, it is the secondary bureaus. You're not freezing your main three. It's the secondary. And we lay that out. Now, there are hundreds of secondary bureaus, but the main ones are the four that you see listed here. ARS, Anovis, LexisNexis, and SageStream. These are the four. We tell you in the video how to contact these companies and start administering your freeze. Step number three. This video, as you can see, is only three minutes long. Check for errors on your report. Guys, did you know that over, I believe the number is 80% of people have errors on their credit report, whether it's small things like their name, their address, their social security number, to bigger things like this debt ain't even mine to begin with. I don't even know this company whatsoever. There are errors on your report. So this video teaches you how to check for the errors on your report, how to circle them, put them in order of importance and start getting things corrected, okay? So far y'all can see, we're talking about two and three minute videos. I'm gonna keep it all the way real with y'all. I'm not one to, you know, really just accept a whole bunch of excuses that I don't have time. I don't have this, right? You know, it's two minutes, it's three minutes. You, you really wanna fix your credit or you don't, to be honest with you. It only takes a few minutes out of your day. I mean, the actual dispute may take a little bit longer, but I promise you, this isn't anything that's taking 24 hours of your time. This is something you could possibly do on a lunch break, to just keeping it real with you. So if, if it's something that you really want to do, you will prioritize this. Step number four is starting your dispute process. Look at that. This video is a little bit longer. Six minutes and 40 seconds. Ooh. Okay. It teaches you how to start the dispute process which for a lot of people is the most challenging part, but y'all, we make it so easy. We have the automated credit dispute letter generator. I'm not gonna click on it because it has our personal information in there, but I am zooming in on it for you. Um, we have some additional videos here in the form of addendums. And this just explains to you why you should never do any of your disputes online. You always wanna do it via certified mail. Um, and then how to actually do the disputes via certified mail. So it walks you step by step. And again, underneath the video, 
you have all of your credit bureaus, their addresses. And if you scroll up a little bit more, all of your dispute letters, they're all here. The identity dispute letter, credit inquiry, your dispute letters one through five, debt validation, goodwill, pay for delete, medical collections, 30 day no response letter. So all of the letters are here. Now the main letters that we use, I'm gonna zoom in on that for you, are credit dispute letters one through five, okay? So when you first start the dispute process, and this will be explained in the video, the very first letter is gonna be your verification letter. You're gonna mail that out. If you get a response back saying, oh, verify, this yours, pay it, send the second letter. The second letter is method of verification letter where you're asking them, okay, you say that it's mine, prove to me how you came up with that. Show me the method that you used to verify that it was my debt. And a lot of the times when you send that letter out, they come back and just remove it altogether because they can't verify it, right? Or they're using a, a system that may be illegal to try and verify that debt. But again, they can't do that. That is grounds for you having the debt removed altogether. So you're going to follow these letters one through five. Um, when you ask a question in the credit repair group that we have you in, y'all, because we do have several different credit repair groups. We have five of them right now. The royalty movement is definitely growing. And each of those groups have over 200 people in them. So we do get a lot of questions, but we are here. That's what we're here for. Not only can myself or Marcus answer your questions, but we also have some team members that can answer your questions. And we answer the questions really fast in the groups. So please don't hesitate to ask your questions. Also, please don't get impatient or frustrated or upset if we refer you back to the system because we're not just gonna give you the answer. You have access to the system and it's walking you step by step. So if we say, hey, log into the My Credit System is video number two. Don't get upset. It's a DIY system, right? And we want you to actually learn how credit works, not just give you a handout. You pay for the system, get everything out of it, right? Another thing, guys, I know sometimes we don't want to ask questions publicly in the group, whether it's because you may be just like a little embarrassed about your situation. But listen, it happens. It's the past. We, we working on correcting it. We're moving forward. It's no big deal. Ask your question in a group for a lot of different reasons. It's a lot of other new members in the group. Let them learn as well. Somebody else most likely had that same exact question. They were just scared to ask it. So ask your questions and let us help everybody all at once, right? Um, it's so much better than reaching out to us like one-on-one -on -one or try to set up some kind of consultation. Guys, we have thousands of members, so it's really impossible for us to do that. We may send you an audio message to kind of help you out. But again, the credit support group is going to always be number one. That's what we're going to refer you to. Okay, let's keep going. And then underneath it, we have some additional things like you'll see everything that we do is by law, FCRA, okay, the Fair Credit Reporting Act. So of course, we have some additional things, uh, some additional information like identity theft claims, uh, filing a complaint. You can do all of that. The state attorney general information, all of that underneath the video, okay? Let's keep going. Step number five. Step number five is credit utilization. Now, here's the thing about credit utilization. It's exactly as it sounds. You utilizing your credit, utilizing your credit cards, really. Now, the thing about credit utilization, it counts towards 30% of your credit score. Guys, this is the one factor that you do have 100% control over because it's dealing just with your credit card use. If you're maxing out cards, your credit utilization is going to be low. That percentage is going to be very low and it will affect your score. If you're late on those payments, it will affect your score. Now, we're not telling you we can wipe out your credit card debt. That's your debt, right? But you want to make sure that you keep your utilization under 10%. I know some people tell you 30%, 33%. We have found that you can get the best score possible. Well, a portion of the best score possible because this is only 30% of your score. 
by keeping your utilization at about 9%. So make sure you write that down. Credit utilization at about 9%. You want it in the single digits, okay? So an example of that, if you have a credit card with a $1,000 limit on it, then you want to make sure that the balance on that card is at about $90 or less. $90 or less. Not $500, $800 because, y'all, you're maxing out your card. Your utilization is going to be high, which is going to drop your score, okay? You'll learn all about that in this video, which I did not mention. It's only one minute and 45 seconds. So very short videos. They're very short, sweet, and to the point. Step number six is building credit because not everybody on this call has things that they want to dispute. Not everybody on this call is, you know, in the worst position. Some people just may have gone through some things or may not have credit at all and just need to build credit. So that's what this video is all about. It's only two minutes and 18 seconds. And we give you not only credit loan builder programs like Self and Credit Strong, but there are secure credit cards that you can apply for. Self, Chime, Opinski, First Progress, Discover It, and we give you some of like the qualifications for those cards. So watch this video. It's really, really good if you're trying to build credit. There are some things that you can do to get that score going up, okay? Also, a download here, how to build credit by paying your rent. That is another one. If you've been renting, you know, one thing about it, when people rent, really, if people rent regardless, when you got a roof over your head, that's that one bill that you're going to make sure you're not laid on, right? You're going to make sure you keep a roof over your head. Some other things you might be a little lenient with, you might get something else cut off, but you ain't getting evicted, right? And, and you, you're you going to make sure you pay your rent or your mortgage on time. If you're renting and you've been paying on time, why not let that count? towards your credit. Now we do have another link that we refer you to for, um, for building your credit, paying your rent. It is under the royaltymovement.com. So if you go to the royaltymovement.com where we kind of break down the credit system, there is a link right there where you can actually get started with paying your rent and letting it count towards your credit, okay? It is not always free, y'all. Uh, actually, none of them are free. None of the programs that do that are free. It might cost you a little bit, but again, this is building your score. And guess what? That's it. <laughs> That's it. If you heard that TikTok video? That's it, y'all. So congratulations. You've successfully completed the system. Four minutes and 35 seconds is your congratulations video. And again, this entire system, 24 minutes and 33 seconds in total. That's what all of the videos come to. So again, watch them in order, follow them step by step. Um, I'm going to be honest with you. I mean, when you're fixing your credit, don't expect miracles in 30 days, especially if you've been messing up your credit for eight years, 10 years, 20 years, right? Give yourself a little bit of time. You may need longer than that. Plus, when you do the dispute process, and I want to address this because there are a lot of new members on here, again, you are not going to find credit repair for $39 or anything less than that per month. And I'm just being perfectly honest with you. A lot of people have attempted. When people quit this company, they end up coming right back. But now they've set themselves back, right? They've set themselves back a little bit more because in between time that they quit, something went on with their credit and they didn't know how to respond, right? They may have started sending the letters the credit bureaus responded, but they quit my income. So now they don't have access to the system anymore. They don't have access to the letters or these video tutorials anymore. So my thing, my thing is don't quit, especially if you're not where you want to be, especially if your credit score is not where it needs to be. If you're trying to buy a house and you know your credit score is supposed to be at a, at a certain level, what you look like quitting, <laughs> right? That makes no sense at all. That's silly. So make sure you stick with it. Some of the dispute processes alone takes more than 30 days, right? You got to give the bureaus 30 days to respond. If you quit within that 30 days, what you going to do when they respond, right? Um, even if, 
And some people try to cheat the system and try to print out all the letters. Well, if you don't know how to use them, that's not going to work, right? Make sure you stick with it. Stick with it on top of just the credit repair system. Again, look at some of the other financial tools that we have in your My Econ membership. Understand money management. That's going to be very sufficient as it pertains to your credit utilization. Another thing sufficient to your credit utilization, if you're having a hard time paying down that credit card, well, we also offer an additional stream of income. That additional stream of income, the money that you make can be put towards your credit card debt. So we have so many different options to really help you level up. It's just a matter of your consistency and your determination. And really, that's all I got. All right, so scroll to step one. And I want you to click on the My Fight, though, because I want to tie it all together. And once you understand this as a whole, it really just puts you ahead of the pack. You got to understand that being a part of my econ allows you to take a holistic approach to bettering your credit. A lot of times when people think about credit repair, the only thing they're thinking about is getting things deleted. That's cool. That's part of what you want to do. But that's not the whole score. She stated, and who knows, just by paying attention, how much is payment history worth in terms of percentage? What percentage does payment history account for in terms of restoring your credit? Now, I'd rather it be somebody new. Payment history. Because that's when you dispute items on your report, what that is doing is, is contesting some of the negative payment history that you may have experienced in the form of collections, in the form of late payments, in the form of charge off. All of those are connected to payment history. So I see somebody said 33%. Not a bad guess. Anybody else want to take a shot at it? Y'all scared? What percentage is payment history? And this is important for you to understand. And really, once you understand what I'm about to share with you, it really lets you know personally what you need to be focused on. Because a lot of times people take blind advice. What do I mean? They'll hear somebody make a suggestion on TikTok or Facebook or IG. This person said this. This person said that. So I did this. Well, if it wasn't applicable to you, then you probably shouldn't have did it. Not all advice is applicable to you. So you got to understand where you fall into the equation of credit in order to better understand what moves you personally need to make. And that's why my econ gave you options. So you can take a holistic approach on your score. I see 33%, 60%, 63%, 30%, 35%, 70%. So payment history, it's only one person out of all of those that gets. One person got it right. So where I am right now is my FICO. MyFICO.com is a place that you can use to pull your credit report because a lot of the bureaus or creditors use FICO in terms of the scoring model in order to determine whether you get approved for something. When you're going to apply for a home, a car, a lot of times, nine times out of 10, they're going to use the FICO scoring model. So you can use the FICO scoring model in order to go about looking at your score and then seeing what changes are being made on a monthly basis. However, you can also use it as an additional education hub. And for those of you who are out there creating content, then this gives you a place where you can use this information and create content that comes directly from the horse's mouth. Now, the power in this is that that's what my econs, my credit system was based on, directly from the horse's mouth, directly from where the banks are pulling their information from directly from where the mortgage brokers are pulling their information from. So we're going straight to the source. No middleman, not skipping around trying to see who says what about who. No, you're going directly to the source. So the my FICO is a great hub. So what I'm going to do is click on education. And I'm going to answer this question because I, like I stated, only one person got that right in terms of payment history. There's a lot of information on here, but I'm only going to focus primarily on one section. And that's the area that says, how are scores calculated? Y'all got to know this. Committed to memory. Learning like you know your ABCs. Learning like you know your favorite song. A lot of y'all know a lot of, have memorized quite a few things. Well, make sure whatever you memorize is something that is beneficial to you, especially something like this, which is pertaining to your credit score. So now that we had this on the screen, I expect everybody to get this correct. How, what percentage does payment history contribute to your credit score without me saying it this is just to see who's paying attention and like i said only one person got it right last time all right now we're jumping out there even the people that were scared to guess the first time because some of y'all were scared it's all right like i tell my boys when you get something wrong that's how you learn sometimes they might be scared to miss something or get something incorrect listen 
taking an L or missing something. That's how you learn. That's how you figure it out futuristically and you don't get it wrong going forward. Truth be told, a lot of times you learn the most by getting something wrong. So if I ask you a question and I want you to put something in the chat, jump out there because you're going to be learning more than a person who's not participating. So now when it comes time for you to be better in your credit, you're going to be ahead of them credit-wise because you participated, you learned even though you got it wrong. So don't be scared to, to miss something. Now, 35% is correct. That is what equates to payment history. That is 192.5 points total. The reason why I know this is because I've committed it to memory. I've you know, done this over and over, talked about this over and over so I can help and educate and empower as many people as possible. And me knowing that it's only 550 points that are available to us. Everybody has at least a 300 point, you know, basis. That's the minimum that you can have. If nobody, has, if you don't have anything on your credit, you've never used your credit, everybody got a 300 minimum. But there's 550 points available out there in terms of your FICO score. So that means you can get up to an 850 credit score. So 35% of that 550 score leaves you with 192.5 points. Why is that important? Well, if you know that 35% of your score is based on payment history, then you know that it's pretty important for you to make on-time payments. And if you fell behind before to where you had late payments and things of that nature, okay, what do you need to do in order to remove some of those late payments, remove some of those collections that had late payments that led to them not being able to collect at all, so it went into collections, or items that they felt they couldn't collect on, so it went to charge off? What can you do to remove those? Because anytime you're sending off letters and you're getting things deleted like collections, late payments, or charge offs, you're strengthening your payment history. So many of you, if you log into any of your credit monitoring services that you may use, you will see what your rating is in terms of your payment history. They may say you have, you know, 80% uh, rating in terms of your payment history. That just basically means that 20% of the time you are late. That's not good. That is really a big thing. I know in school, 80% is a beast, so you might feel like you're passing. But in the world of credit, you want that thing to say 95, 97, 99, 100 primarily. And you get there by making on-time payments from this day forward. And then secondly, by cleaning up the negativity that you might already have on your report. That's what the letters are all about. So when you saw the coin breaking down, how to go about pulling your reports, noticing the errors, and then getting to the letter dispute process, that's the clean up the payment history. But this is what you got to understand. That's only one part of it. That it's still 65% left that most people don't target. See, anytime you talk to somebody who, who's talking about restoring your credit, if you've ever questioned or asked somebody to restore your credit for you, or if you ever listen to anybody, if they're only talking about how fast they can get things deleted, then you, know, you might want to reconsider because it's still 65% that has not been being discussed by most people. But my econ takes a holistic approach. So as you notice, the 30%, and here they list it as amounts owed. So that's what my econ calls credit utilization. Same difference. It's just a matter of how much do you owe in terms of a balance overall in this particular category. Now, it's two ways to look at this. You want to make sure that your amounts owed or the percentage or your credit utilization is as low as possible due to the fact that you get graded based on how low of a balance you had, especially when it comes to credit cards, because that's where usually credit utilization is based. Credit cards and or lines of credit. Sometimes a company might give you a line of credit and let you spend based on that line of credit. And it might not have a credit card associated with it, but it still counts towards your credit utilization. So I don't want you to you know, mistake that because sometimes you may even have a loan with a furniture company. I've seen that. Somebody might have a loan with a furniture company or a department store or you know, a mattress company and it's showing up as a line of credit. They may have thought it was a loan, but if you look at how it's reporting, it's showing up as a line of credit, which means that as long as you still have a high balance on that item, it's going to be affecting your credit utilization. Now, with 30% of your score being based on credit utilization, that's 165 points per bureau. So it's important to understand how to properly pay your credit cards off. And the second way I want you to look at it is if you do not have a credit card or a line of credit, you too are also leaving 165 points on the table. So anytime I'm looking at a client's report and I see, okay, this person, it may show on their credit report that they have 100% in terms of their credit utilization, meaning that 
they have a zero balance. They, they rate that at 100%. That's why it's okay to have a zero balance. I know we say less than 10%, but it is okay to have a zero balance on your report because you get 100% rating on that. But sometimes you get 100% rating by having a zero balance simply because you do not have a credit card at all. Well, that's not good because you're not benefiting from the 165 points that are available to you in that area. So if you do not have a credit card, then MyEcon has a link that could position you to start building your credit by getting and obtaining a credit card because that's important. But if you do have a credit card, get that balance low. Less than 10% ideally, 0% is fine as well. Now, if you don't remember anything else, I want y'all to remember this because this is money in terms of you bettering your credit. And this is something that I've seen help people in the quickest way possible. So for those of you who have a credit card, and let's say you got a credit card and the limit is 1000 thousand, two thousand, decent, decently high. The higher the limit, the better. So if you just got a starter card and they might have 200, 300, 500 on there, you're not going to max out the points. You're not going to get up to 165 points on there. You got to, you know, get a little bit more skin in the game and get your, your limits up. However, you can build the habits that will transfer so once you do have a high credit limit, it can benefit you greatly. But if you don't remember anything else, this is what I want you to remember. When it comes to those credit cards, you want to know the right way to pay those credit cards off and down in a way that best benefits you. So what you want to do, and this is your homework, if you do not know this number or if you have not done this just yet, if you have a credit card, what I want you to do is find out. And no matter how many credit cards you have, contact each company individually. Find out what day of the month do they report to the credit bureaus. Each creditor has a day. Capital One might report on the 20th. You know, Bank of America might report on the 10th. Whatever it is, whoever it is that you have, find out what day of the month they report to the bureaus. Why is that important? See, if you know what day they're going to report to the bureaus, now you got an upper hand. Now you got an advantage. Now you have a slight edge. Now you know what day they're going, they going to snitch to the bureaus and tell them what your balance is looking like. So if you know they're going to go to the bureaus on a particular day and say, hey, this is how her credit is, her, her balance is looking. This is how his balance is looking. Now you can say, okay, before they go snitch and tell what my balance is, let me go ahead and get this balance down as low as I possibly can. Let me go ahead and get it down to zero if possible. Let me get it down less than 10% if possible. And you want to do it before that date comes. So, for example, if they report on the 10th, just throwing something out there, let's say you decide, you know what, they report on the 10th. Let me go ahead and get that balance down less than 10% or it's a zero by the 8th. And then you just leave it there for at least five days. Like I say, you know, five days to a week, give or take, to make sure that it reported. Two things are going to happen from that. Three, actually, if you pay it down to zero. A couple of things going to happen. When they report that you have a zero balance, the credit bureaus are going to look at it and say, oh, he has a zero balance or less than 10 percent or a lower than last month balance. Let's give him a couple of points increase. And for many people, it can be a big increase. I had a few clients who just took that simple advice right there and their score increased a couple of hundred points within a 30 day, 35 day window. They had high credit limits, so it affected their score pretty drastically. But that's the importance of it. That's the impact that it can have. But once they report a low balance, the bureaus are going to say, OK, let's go ahead and give them a point boost up to 165 points. The other thing that's going to happen is that the creditors, when they see a track record of you making those payments on time, but more importantly, getting that balance low before they report to the bureau, they're going to say, OK, she's low risk. She's keeping a low balance. And if you do it and have a track record, and by track record, I mean you do it consistently, 90 days plus, to where they're able to see, okay, each month, they're keeping a low balance. When we report, they're less than 10%. They're at 0%. Now this person is low risk. This is the ideal customer that we like. They increase their credibility. We can trust them with more money. So what the creditors tend to do when they see that you're keeping your balances low every time they report they want to give you more money because they can trust you with more money because you've shown and proven your credibility. So they may take that thousand dollar credit limit and turn it into two thousand, three thousand, five thousand. Some of y'all have experienced this. Angela Sam, she's always sharing testimonies of how her and her husband, they've increased their credit limit just by simply understanding how to properly pay their credit cards off. 
And now they, you know, increase their credit limit drastically over and over and over again because the banks and the predators trust them with more money. That happened with us as well. We were using a car, paying it off, using it, paying it off. And one, you know, a couple of times they like took a credit limit from 6000 to 10000 or whatever the case may be. They just ran the limits up because they saw the credibility and our track record for paying things down low. And then the last thing that happens when you keep that utilization low is that you save money on interest. So a lot of times people focus on how much the interest rate is on a credit card. And that's important. So don't, don't get me wrong. Don't make me, don't, you know, it's not, I'm not here to say that having a low interest rate isn't important, but quick math. If the interest rate on the credit card is 22%, just throwing a number out there, but you got a zero balance, how much did they charge you in interest? That's the question. I want y'all to answer that in the comments. If the credit card interest rate is 22%, but you got a zero balance. How much are they going are they going to charge you in interest for that month? Type it in the chat. Okay, y'all getting it. Y'all getting it. I see number zero. Number zeros. So 22% of a zero balance is zero. So that means they didn't make money off of you. They didn't make a dime off of you. So the interest rate did not matter. So you can have, you can use your car how you see fit. And, and this is something I want to add to that. It's not that we say you got to keep your balance less than 10% as if you can't use the car. No, you just got to know when to have that balance down to zero or less than 10% every month. You can have a $2,000 credit limit and use $1,999 of it as long as you know not to be late and you know make sure it's paid by the due date. But more importantly, have that balance down as low as possible before they report to the bureaus and it's still going to make your credit look good. And they still will position you to not pay anything in interest. So it's a it's a it's a win for win for win. The bureaus get your point increase. The creditors start to see that you're more credible and they increase your credit limit, which help which helps you even more. And you're paying no interest. So that's very powerful. I like to spend a lot of time on that because that can give you a big impact once you truly understand it. And if you don't have a credit card yet, keep that in mind. Make sure you make a note of it, put a star by it. Highlight it, whatever you do, in order to ingrain it into your memory, because it's, it's that important. And then next, we have credit mix, new credit, and length of credit history. So let's talk about the length of credit history. That's just the age of your credit. The thing about the age of your credit, that usually just comes with time. But some people can leverage someone else's good credit history in order to give them more credit history. So if you're new to using your credit, but you got a family member who is not new to the credit game. Well, they can add you as an authorized user and you get to leverage their good payment history, their good credit history, utilization. It helps you in more ways than one. Throwing Angela out there again, Angela Sam, she's used this strategy to help her kids boost their credit. Her, her kids came out of high school with a seven, maybe, I want to say, a, I know it's 700 plus, but it could have been a 750 plus because she was able to use the authorized user strategy. She was real deal strategic in terms of making sure that she was serious about her credit so she could use her habits to help her kids. And now when the kids left school, they had 700, 750 plus credit just off of them borrowing their mother's good credit habits. And now they were able to benefit off of it. So that's one of the things that my econ teaches as well. And it's not based on age. So for example, you may have a child who's four years old, five years old. Well, if the credit card company allows you to add someone to a, to the card as an authorized user, they have the restrictions or or not. Some companies don't have any age restrictions to where you can have a newborn baby added. Some companies, they got to be at least 12. It just depends. You got to check the details of that particular company and just make sure before you go into adding a child as an authorized user that you have your, uh, your habits intact because you can also damage their credit. I know y'all know about, you know, well, I don't know. I can't speak about everybody else. But I know in my neighborhood, it was times where parents might use their kids' information and it hurt their credit because they're using their kids' information to apply for certain things. We ain't talking about that. We ain't talking about damaging your kids' credit. We talking about them leveraging your good habits and you adding them because you have your habits intact, you have your balances low, and you can give them a, a head start versus setting them back. So very important. Now, the last two, new credit and credit mix, these both are worth 
10% of your score each individually, which is 55 points per bureau, 55 points per bureau. And basically new credit is basically is, is bundled up into a couple of things. Number one, you don't want to have a lot of increase because if you have a lot of increase, those increase tend to ding at your credit report, especially if it's increase that you don't have an account with. So, for example, a lot of times when people apply for a car to car dealership, they may run your credit 10 times. Well, only one company out of those 10 approved you for the loan. Those other nine can be hurting your score, regardless of what they say. So those are the ones you want to consider having removed not the one that you actually have an account with. So you want to keep those inquiries low because it, it hurts you in the area of new credit. The last two years of your credit profile are also a reflection of new credit as well. So if you haven't done anything new in terms of using your credit, then it might be a good idea to get some new good history, good payments, good things showing up on your profile to make sure that you are not losing out on points just because you haven't done anything with your credit in a while. And for some people, you may need to consider getting some new things if you don't have anything on your credit at all. So it's just a couple of things to consider. It's one of the smallest pieces. But if you follow the My Credit System plan to a T, that area will take care of itself. If you follow the My Credit plan to, the, to a T, the credit mix will also take care of itself because the credit mix is basically just saying, hey, how good is this person at utilizing multiple types of credit? Are they good at using credit cards and, and understanding how to pay their credit cards off in a way that gives them the best benefit from the credit utilization factor? Okay. Is this person also good at installment loans, which is anything like a car note, a mortgage, a auto loan, or car note, auto loan, same thing, personal loan, even the self-lender, that's an installment loan. So if you're good at a combination of both, meaning you're good at knowing how to pay down credit cards, but also pay installment loans or payments that don't have a revolving credit attached to it, then you get the max amount of points in that area as well, which is up to 55 points. When you put all five of these factors together, it totals up to 550 points. 100% of all of these equal 550 points. So when you see somebody who has 800 plus credit score, they're benefiting from all of these factors. Now, what you need to do is be able to look at your credit report and see what it is that you're missing. This is how you position yourself to not take bad advice. Because when you just listen to something somebody tells you, even me, I may give do a video and it may speak on credit utilization. It may speak on building new credit, but that might not be applicable to you. I usually do a good job of aim to let people know, listen, for a person who falls into this category, you may want to do this. But if you know your numbers, if you know your profile and you know what you're lacking or what you're missing, now you can say, oh, this is why my credit is the way it is. It's this payment history area. I've been messing up in the payment history. Let me make sure I'm making my own time payments going forward and cleaning up the things that are on my profile that's making this area of payment history have my credit to be less than ideal. Oh, it's my credit utilization. The Smiths told me how to keep my balances low. Let me find out when they report to the Bureau so I know exactly when to have my utilization down to zero or less than 10%. Oh, it's because I don't have any credit history. I only got two years worth of history on my report. You know, let me let me get some more skin in the game or maybe I got a parent or, uh, you know, uh, aunt or whatever the case may be that can allow me to be added as an authorized user because I know they're going to be good with their credit long term because that, that's always how they've been. So you got to look at your own profile, come back to this drawing board and understanding these five factors, which one you're missing out on and using the My Econ system to bring it all together. So I didn't want to go through and show you it's a lot. Everything that I see is broken down on this page, you know, in their own way, talking about the credit mix, the percentage, the details of it. You're welcome to go check that out. But I just wanted you to focus on this pie chart because this is what you need to commit to memory. And this is what My Econ is doing when we take you through the my credit system and this is an example of you taking a holistic approach to bettering your credit and that's what we're about in my econ not just giving you a little piece of the pie no give you the whole thing in order to focus on all five factors to get the best score possible all right we're gonna open up for questions i hope y'all got some out of that i hope y'all got some nuggets i hope y'all really took everything to heart when i said if you don't remember anything else because I know for a fact this can benefit you greatly. And I know because I help people directly 
as well. I look at a lot of credit reports and I see the things that that's hampering and helping people's score. All right. So if you have a question, you can put it in the chat. You can unmute. Is it set to what I can unmute? Um, I will set it to where y'all can unmute. One moment. Okay, y'all, so all you have to do, if you see the microphone, let me stop share real quick. If you see the microphone at the top, just tap the microphone, unmute yourself, and ask your question. Hi, this is Gwen. How are you? Doing great. How you doing, Gwen? So, going good. So, I tried, I... I was dealing with a mortgage company. I'm trying to buy a home and um, I don't have too many people that want to put me as an authorized user. I do already have a secure credit card, but it's still not as high. Do you, can you have more than one? Can you have more than one secure credit card? So uh, let's unpack that a little bit. How long have you had the secure credit card and how uh, much uh, is the credit limit? I did 200 and I've had it for about six months. Okay. And is that credit card, that secure credit card, is it reporting to all three bureaus? I don't know. I, yeah, because it was on, I think I see, yeah, it's on there. It's it's in good standing. Okay. Find out if it's reporting to all three bureaus. And what I mean by that is make sure that when you look at your report, it's showing up on Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion. You want it to be reporting to all three bureaus. Sometimes, you know, I don't know why, but sometimes they only, well, I know why, but they sometimes they only report to one or two. You want a good secure credit card that's reporting to all three bureaus. So find that out. Now, this is another thing that you can do that can help to strengthen your FICO score. And I'm glad you asked it because I didn't talk about it. But it's, and this is not in the uh, My You Come Back office. This is the importance of hopping on calls, trainings, asking questions, because I, you know, I'm always consuming additional knowledge that can best help clients as well as help you as well. But with a secure credit card, another thing that you can do in the meantime, since you don't have somebody who's, you know, can add you as an authorized user, is you can add more money and make sure, confirm with that card, you can add more money to the card. So instead of you, saying, okay, maybe I need to get another secure credit card. And now you got all of these credit cards that got low balances. You can start adding money to that card. So you started off with $200. Okay. Get that balance all the way down to zero and treat that card almost like a savings to a degree. And it, and some people don't like to do this because they feel like they're losing money, but I promise you it can help you. And then when you do apply for actual unsecured credit card, they'll see, okay, that you have a higher limit. So this is what I mean. So say you got a $200 credit limit now. Let's say every now and then you add more money to it. You add $300. Now you got a $500 limit. You add another $500. Now you got a $1,000 limit. That counts as activity. You don't necessarily have to be using that card because you add money to it is counting as activity. But now you got a credit card that has a $1,000 limit instead of a $200 limit. That tends to help you out and it holds a little bit more weight. And you can continue to add more, but let's just say you stop that $1,000 limit. Well, now if your score is increasing based on you applying everything that we've been talking about, and now you're at a place of, I usually recommend at least the score being in the 600 range. So now say your score is 600 range. And now you say, you know what, let me go ahead and apply for an unsecured card. Once you're at that point, let me know, because I got a, a card that I recommend to clients. It's a pre-approval. So it usually doesn't, it doesn't, impact a person's credit score and I you know had somebody recently got approved last week and they may start you off with a smaller amount but the point is it's an unsecured card you didn't have to put any money down now if they see that you you have a decent score 600 ish and you got a secure credit card with a thousand dollar limit when they go to consider approving you for the card they're likely to approve you for a bit of a higher limit than they would have because they see that you already have a credit card that has a thousand dollar limit. They don't have to know that you are the one who put the money down to get it to that thousand dollar limit. That, that doesn't necessarily matter, but you at least started doing some things on your own in order to position yourself to increase your score and increase your credit limit. So now when you apply for new cards or new unsecured cards, they're likely to give you a high credit limit because how the banks look at it is they're like, okay, who else trusts her with a high limit? If, if having nobody else trusted her with 
ten thousand dollars. Let me go ahead and you know only approve for two hundred dollars. So they want to see higher limits, and then it just helps anytime you're going to acquire another car. So that's what I would do going forward. Add more money, keep that balance low, you know, at zero. It's like you're not even using it, but just continue to make that credit limit higher as long as they allow it, and then you know apply for an unsecured car down the line. Does that make sense? Yeah. Great question. I know you're uh, you're probably hungry to get that mortgage, but you you got it's a couple of things you're gonna have to do to get in place to position yourself, and that's something I think can really help you if you apply it. Okay, thank you. No problem. Great question. Anybody else? Chris, questions, comments, feedback, etc. I got a question about the letter of support. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, what you got? The the like the difference between the six twenty three and the 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 VOD letter, like when they use the v, the validation letter versus the six twenty three letter. Okay, so the validation letter is usually what you send to the creditors. So, for example, if a new account just hit, you know, sometimes when a person gets something in the mail that says something went towards collection or something went towards the charge off, well, the validation letter you would send directly to the creditor. So say it was, you know, uh, any collection, you can just throw anything out there. Say it's a collection LLC. They have sent a letter saying that this item belongs to you. And then what you can do is send a validation letter because now you're saying, hey, okay, I see that you saying this collection belongs to me. Valid I need you to validate this debt. So it, it kind of functions as the verification letter that we sent to the bureaus. Instead, you're sending it directly to the creditors. And now they have to validate that this belongs to you. And it's better if you do it right away. So within the first 30 days or the first two weeks of you receiving that letter, because now they have to prove, OK, if this is a collection you say is belong, say belongs to me, I want you to validate it and prove that it belongs to me. And a lot of times they're not in position to do that because they don't expect people to do that. They expect people to ignore it, leave it alone. And then 30 days later, it hits their report without any uh, proof. So that's the validation letter. It goes directly to the creditors, not to the bureau. Make sense? So what about the 623 then? The 623, are you talking about the 609? The 609 letters, is that what you're referring to? Um, The, the step... When you doing an order, like the um, verification, the method, then I thought it was six. Yeah, look nope. at it I don't, I don't usually use, because I try to teach from an angle of understanding, I don't usually throw out the terms like six this, six that. But most of the time, people are talking about the 609 letters. Those are the verification, method of verification letter, the, the letters that might even have lined up. Those fall under the 609 letters. 623, I'm without me looking it up, I don't know if that's anything different than what we have, but those are the letters that go directly to the bureaus. And most of the time it's referred to as the 609 letters. The, um, the 603. It's, it's called the, it's the, let me look at it. It's the number three letter, the original credit dispute. It's, is it in, is it in those main five letters? Uh-huh. It's it's number three. Yeah. Original creditor dispute. Okay. So yeah, any of those one through five letters, those are going to the main three bureaus. The validation letter is going directly to the credit. So that that's the main difference. Who is going to? It may request the same information, but it's a matter of who is being mailed to. So the validation letter is going directly to a Bank of America or to whatever collection company that sent you a letter. The other, so it's asking them to prove something. Then the other letters that in those one through five is going to experience Equifax TransUnion one or all three, depending on how it's showing up on the profile. Does that make sense? Does that, does that help? Mm -hmm. Well, on here it says that it goes to the creditor, not the credit bureau. So that's why I was confused about it. So if you say it goes to the creditor, then it, it goes to the credit. So it sounds like you're okay. talking about their validation letter. So whatever, if it says it goes to the credit, then that's who it goes to. But most of the ones in one through five go directly okay. to the bureau. So it's just a matter of who you're okay. trying to get to prove whatever it is. But okay. whatever it's listed as who it goes to. And I think you, I think you, I think I know what section you're in. But yeah, whoever says it, that's who it gets mailed to, 
that's who it gets mailed to. But for the most part, most of the disputes that all of you are going to be doing, just so nobody else is confused, most of the letters, for the most part, are going to be going to the main three bureaus because that's who you're trying to get to clean up the items. Not because the creditors aren't the ones who's going to remove it from the main three that's going to have an impact on your score. You're just trying to get them up off of you. And if you have to use any of the things that they sent you or what they can validate to your advantage to help you get it removed from the main three, then you can. But the main three bureaus are the most important because they are the ones who keep something on your report or remove something on your report. So most of you are going to be mailing something to them. There are some chance, some times where you might mail a letter to the creditor, but in most cases, it's going to be to the main three bureaus. Any other questions? Yeah, let me check the chat. I was um gonna piggyback from what she has said because I think that um can you just say basically when is a good time to mail those letters off? From my understanding, it would be after you completed round one and round two, and maybe the creditor still has something on your credit report and it's not supposed to be there. Is yeah, that that's what, yeah, I think that um, might clarify a little bit because I got a couple of those questions too. Okay, yeah, that's a time when you can as well, and one of the best times is if they just sent you something in the mail. Because sometimes when you start the dispute process, some of these creditors will start sending you something in the mail. As soon as they send you something, you file for one of those letters that's meant for them. Basically, you know, like she said about the original creditor, that's basically saying, okay, you send me this letter, you're a collection company, I didn't go into an agreement with you, can you show me who's the original creditor? Who did I originally go into the agreement with? So it's getting them to prove how they, uh, you know, how they acquired that particular debt. So as soon as they send a letter, that's one of the best times to send them one of those letters. But yes, you know, Anisha, you're right as well. You can do it that way. But one of the best times, as soon as they send you something, because now you got them where you want them. It's like, hey, prove it. Since you just sent me this, I want you to prove why you had the ability to send me this. Okay. I got one more quick really good question that you might want to answer for some people um so um somebody that i know that has signed up before they didn't follow the process the way that we follow it they went and researched tiktok and youtube and sent those um things online and then um she had kind of came back and was asking me basically what was the next step so i was telling her um i'm not really i can't really tell you what the next step is because i don't know what you disputed on online and what's on your credit report still and what has came back so i advise her to just start back from the beginning so can you kind of touch on that a little bit so people will know so they won't just try to take the easy right route out and go online and dispute and they will follow in order yeah it is That's good. you know everybody who my econ is methodical it's a reason why they do certain things in a certain way and each letter builds on top of the other one so sometimes if people jump to doing something and it's out of order in terms of how my econ does it, then you might not be doing yourself any service. You might do yourself a disservice. So when my econ has the first letter as the verification letter, they already know the second letter that they're going to send before you even send the first letter. So it's really about posturing and positioning yourself no matter what they say, because we don't care what they say after that first letter for the most part. The verification letter is just saying, hey, I want you to verify that this debt, this item belongs to me. Now, sometimes that letter alone can get things removed based on the verbiage and just based on you know how things work. However, if they come back and say, hey, this item was verified, this item does belong to you, then guess what? We already knew the next letter we were sending. We send in the method of verification letter. So now the method of verification letter holds more weight because you already had them to respond or go through an investigation from the investigation, I mean, from the verification letter. So now when you come with the method of verification letter, you got them where you want them, all because you postured yourself with that first letter. And then if that letter doesn't result in results with the method of verification letter, you can come with the third letter, which builds on top of the second letter. So that's everything is in order for a certain reason. It's a reason to it because the next letter builds on the last, even down to you sending the, the no response letter. If they didn't respond in a timely fashion, 
that letter builds on the fact that you sent out a letter that they didn't do a proper investigation on. If you do an intent to litigate, that letter builds upon a previous letter. So make sure you do it in that order because if you go out of order, now you don't have the backing that the previous letter might have gave you. So hopefully that, that does help. That's a great question, Anisha. Okay, so Natalie asked in the chat, is it preferable to send all letters certified and is the timing to respond based on date of received? Great question, great question. So usually the time to respond is based on the, you know, the date of when the letter was, whatever date you have on that certified letter. So yes, it's better to send it certified because now you can track it better. You're tracking the date and they can't, you know, uh, deny that it was sent because you did it certified and usually you do it with a return receipt and notarized for those of you who may be wondering notarized basically means that you had a notary public to sign and it just adds some extra power to the letter it turns it from just being a letter to an affidavit so notarized and certified is recommended based on the my econ standards and usually the date that you want to base it on is the date that you get it stamped at the post office when you send it out so usually i think in terms of 30 to a 35 day window so if they ain't did what I needed them to do within a 35 day window, then it's no excuses because you had more than enough time to respond with a correspondence letter. You had more than enough time to receive it. So if you just look at the initial date when you got that thing stamped and you just give yourself that 30 to 30, I usually say 35 days just to be honest. Now I know for sure there's no excuses in terms of my next letter and whatever else I had them to do. But definitely certified and notarized is a good practice in terms of how we operate in my econ. Great question. All right, so Ms. Shirley asked if a collection company purchased a charge-off account from credit card company and they updated your credit report after you sent a certified letter to the credit bureau, we still send verification letters or I think she's asking or a different letter. Read that one more time. If a collection company purchased the charge-off account from a credit card company and they updated your credit report after you sent the certified letter to the credit bureau, we still send verification letter okay. or a different letter? I think I know what you're saying. And if I, and if this is not what you're saying, feel free to unmute or re-ask the question. If an account shows up on your profile and it's showing up as a new account, and sometimes it does that, like if somebody just purchased an account, and it might show up as a new account on your profile, you can still go with the verification letter because you're like, hey, I see this new account. You know, it looks like it might be a charge off something that was purchased. You still want them to verify it. And then you go through the measures of verification, method of verification, things of that nature. Now, that's that. So the answer is yes, primarily if it's showing up as a new account. However, sometimes what happens is an account that was deleted actually just got added back to your account and they might've changed how it looks a little bit, but you know, it's the same account. If that's the case, then I've provided what's known as an unlawful reinsertion letter to anybody that's in a royalty movement. It's not in the My Econ Back office. Again, it's the things that I've acquired just over the time of me helping clients, et cetera. But the unlawful reinsertion letter basically says, listen, if you added an account to my profile that was deleted, but you didn't give me a five day window to let me know that you were about to add this to my account, then you violated my rights. So the unlawful reinsertion basically said, you added this to my account unlawfully. So the letter basically says, you know, it has some verbiage in there and some dates on there. And then I've used that letter to get certain items that might have came back as a charge off for a collection or just a, you know, as the original account. I've used that letter to get certain items removed that were once off, but they brought back unlawfully. Because that sounds like an unlawful behavior. And they do that all the time. They might purchase this or, you know, rebrand themselves and add that account back just to keep reporting that negativity on your profile. And, you know, you can either address it from a verification letter if it's just a new account, but if it's something that was gone and then popped back up, the unlawful reinsertion letter is what I would recommend. It was on the, um, I'm able to talk and I was driving before and I could, it was, okay. um, credit one was the credit card company and Midland Credit purchased it. And originally it was on there with credit one, but they had closed it or charged it off rather. They charged it off maybe like two years ago and Midland bought it after I sent the 
the the letters to the credit bureaus, all three of them, um, because I saw that they were on um all three, and when I look back on it, it had updated when they sent the you know when they send you your new credit report or whatever, mm-hmm. it was on there and it had buyer on there, all the information at first was was different on all three. And then all of a sudden it, it had Midland credit credit on there as the buyer, which they bought it. And Midland sent me a letter trying to make me pay it, which the credit card was never with them. It was with credit one, period. Got you. So in that case, you would send Midland the validation letter that we talked about. That's an example of sending a letter directly to the creditor. So basically you're getting them to validate, hey, you send me this. I know you weren't the original creditor. I want you to validate this. Now you're sending that letter, a validation letter directly to Midland, but you're sending a verification letter, which is letter number one in that group of letters that says letters one through five. You're sending a verification letter to the bureaus. So you're doing both. You're sending, if it say it reported to all three bureaus, you're sending a verification letter, to all three bureaus that includes that account, but you're also sending a validation letter to Midland. So in that case, you would be sending four letters. If that item is reporting to all three bureaus, you're sending the verification letter to Experian, Equifax, TransUnion, and the validation letter to Midland. So that would be a total of four letters at once. Okay, okay. That's what I needed to know so I know how to move forward with it because I didn't even reply to them um at all until I just wanted to make sure I send the right letter when I do send it. Okay. Absolutely. Yep. So write that down. Validation letter will go to Midland and you'll see the validation letter in the list of letters and then the verification letter, which is the letter number one inside of the letters one through five, you'll send that to Experian, Equifax, TransUnion, and just make sure you include the account that you know your dispute. Okay. I got it. Thank you so much. Not a problem, not a problem. Great question. Y'all on fire tonight. What else y'all got? Okay, I don't see anything okay. else in the chat. Okay, go ahead. Okay, I just started, and so I watched all the videos, and I've frozen all of my secondaries, and I'm ready to start disputing, but when I printed out my credit reports, I noticed one of them had, like, every old address on there, like, all my last names that were, I mean, do I need to clean that up before I start sending out dispute letters? Great question. I'm glad somebody asked that. Now, in the system, it does talk about updating your personal information, but this is what, you know, information is is not in there. So to answer your question, no, go ahead and start the dispute process with the verification letter and then, you know, go through the process. So go ahead and start doing that without updating the personal information. Now, you will see a lot of people online talking about update your personal information that can help you boost your score. You'll see all of these different things. Not that that's 100% wrong, but this is what you got to understand. When I just went over the five factors with you and I talked about which item was worth 35%, which item, which factor was worth 30%, which was worth 15%, which was worth 10%, and the other one that was worth 10%. Neither of those factors said anything about your personal information being updated. So it's not the personal information being incorrect alone that's going to help your score anyway. What it does do, if you do update your information and make sure all of the addresses match, they have your current name spelling, it can increase the chances of getting things deleted. Now, the reason why I don't just automatically jump to recommending a person change their personal information is because If you go in there and tell them you only want this address, you only want this spelling, but you don't contact all of your other positive reporting accounts and let them know, hey, this is my current address. This is my correct spelling of my name, et cetera. Then you can end up hurting yourself because some of the accounts that might be reporting positive, it could be student loans because a lot of student loans are actually helping some people's credit report. It could be some other loans, some car notes that you paid off and you had good standings. They may have the old addresses. They may have the incorrect names. So if you don't go and update that information with them, now it's not going to match your new uh, personal info that you had correctly. So I recommend if a person just really wants to do that to make sure you contact each and every creditor that's on your profile that's positive reporting and give them all of the current information so that it matches with the bureaus. That's usually more work. 
for the person when I know personally that a person can send a verification letter and still get some things deleted because it's not based on just your name, spelling, your address. It's based on them uh, improperly reporting certain things, certain things not matching, them not being able to prove that certain items belong to you and you didn't have to go through and call every positive reporting account and update your, your information. So you can go through the process of the letters without updating that information and still have success. Now, if we come to a point to where you tried everything and now we're like, okay, I got a certain amount of things done, but it's a couple of things that, you know, that still didn't get done, then okay, we can always go back to that. But right now, just so you can develop and build some momentum, I recommend just jumping out there with a verification letter and, you know, going ahead and go through the dispute process that way. Does that answer your question? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Not a problem. My pleasure. Who else we got? Who else? That's a good one. I hope y'all caught that. I hope y'all caught, uh, you know, that. Because a lot of people, that's one of the ones that's floating around heavily. So people just think that them correcting their information is going to boost their score. That's not how it works. When you understand five factors, you, you won't get lost in everybody's recommendation and just take all the advice and just start jumping the gun and doing things. Okay. Anybody else? Hold on. I want to make sure I'm not missing anything in the chat. Um, I don't see anything else in the chat. Feel free to unmute y'all. Um, and we'll be wrapping it up shortly. So get your questions in while you got, while you got him, <laughs> while you got Mr. Smithfield. I got a quick question. Just, um, what's the best way to remove like an old repo off, off, your, off your credit? Good question. So really the best way is just going through the normal My Econ process. We've had people to remove anything, everything you can think of going through that process, going through the verification letter, going through the method of verification, going through all of that. Because truth be told, with the something like a repo, it's very similar to a collection. It's very similar to a charge-off. The company has already did what they was going to do with that account. In many cases, they've already either taken a tax deduction, they've already uh, got the money back because they resold the item. Now it's just on your report and it's an eyesore and it's hurting your score. So if you go through the verification process, a lot of times it's not even worth it to them to even contest that dispute when the bureaus try to prove that that belongs to you. So just going through the normal steps is, you know, has been very successful for people with everything you can think of, repos, collections, charge offs you name it. Thank you. No problem, no problem. Okay, I see a question in the chat from Natalie. Do FICO impact business credit the same as personal credit? Does FICO impact business credit? So what happens is a lot of times when you're using your personal credit in business and you're using yourself as a personal guarantee, anything associated with your personal credit can offset your business credit because you use yourself as a personal guarantee or guarantor as they would call it but the main thing is that's the importance of taking full control and making sure your personal credit is intact to where if you do leverage their personal credit for business then you know it's a win-win scenario because your personal credit can have a negative impact on whatever you're trying to do business wise so if they've already you've already started using yourself as a pg then you doing some negative things with your personal credit can offset things on the business side as well. Some of them use the same bureaus because it's an experienced business. It's a transunion business account. So they communicate with each other and they can, you know, uh, determine whether or not you're doing what you need to do on the personal side. And it can offset it if you don't have it separated. So that's a little a deeper conversation. I'm more so specialized in personal credit, but I do know that they can affect one another. Good question. Any more questions out there before great we? Great question. Yeah, absolutely. Great question. All right. Anybody else, feel free to unmute or type it in the chat. And we will be wrapping it up here shortly. We want to we want to make sure we answer as many questions as we possibly can. These are some really good questions tonight. So I hope y'all are learning a lot. A lot of times people have those credit questions and, you know, either hesitate on asking, just didn't think to ask the question. So we like to do these credit classes or Q&As 
every so often because we always have a new flow of people coming in. And sometimes people just didn't even know how to access the system. So how the Queens yeah. broke down the simple steps. And then just letting you know how short it is. It's less than 25 minutes. The whole the whole training. Now, of course, you got to watch the video then take the action. But still make time. You know, you make time to do it. And then, you you know, you make progress. Because that's what we really want. We want to see those testimonies. You saying, hey, I got this deleted. I got a $10,000 collection deleted off my report. My score went up 70 points. That's what we want to see. Yeah, and let me just add, um, guys, when you get testimonies, please share them. Don't hold it. Don't keep it to yourself. We want to know. We want to celebrate you on our personal social medias, in the group, in the credit groups. We want to you know, put your face and your testimony on a banner so that we can blast this because we know my econ works and the more testimonies we get, the more people we can really, you know, honestly help. Um, I just seen something come through. Hold on, let me make sure. Student loans, somebody just sent a message that says student loans, but I don't know what your question is pertaining to student loans. It just shows an iPhone user. So if you want to unmute and ask that question, or if you're just asking if student loans can be removed, because we get that one all the time. Can student loans be removed? Uh, what's the process for getting student loans removed? If that's more so your question, we can answer that. Yeah, if that's your question, people have used that same flow. That same verification letter, method of verification, use that same flow to get certain student loans removed. So that's something you really want to stick to. Now, I will say this about student loans. A lot of people, they want to get rid of the student loans just because it's just a fat loan they don't want on their, on their report. <laughs> yeah. I get it, trust me, especially my perspective on student loans and college. You know, that's a whole other conversation. But I get it. However, sometimes those student loans are benefiting the individual, what I mean. So sometimes those student loans have a, a long credit history because it's one of the oldest accounts that that person might've had because they got it at a younger age. It might be reporting as being paid on time for years because they got it in, you know, forbearance or whatever, you know, whatever status that they have it in. So it's being reported as positive payments for years. So that's helping their payment history. Now, it does offset that debt to income ratio sometimes when it comes to trying to buy a home, but, you know, there's ways around that as well. However, those student loans can be of benefit. And sometimes when you get those student loans removed, depending on the type of student loan, that doesn't mean you don't owe the debt. It just got removed from your credit report. So it makes your credit report look better. Your debt to income ratio isn't, you know, as out of whack. But we have had people to successfully, several people to successfully remove student loans using that same flow, that same process. So hopefully that answers your question and give you some insight because I've seen people remove student loans and hurt their credit as well because yeah. it was the oldest account and it had the, the most positive payment history for a certain amount of years. So just make sure you understand. It goes back down to the five factors. Make sure you understand what each item is contributing to your score or you know what disservice each item is doing to your score so you can best operate because not everybody should get, you know, student loans removed. And I will say this, not every item should be deleted either. Some things need to be updated to positive. So look at the profile just because it got some late payments. But major say you had an account that had five late payments associated with it, but you got four years of a track record of on time payment. You don't want to get that whole account deleted because it got too many positives associated with it. And that you want to use a goodwill letter in, in the hopes of getting that particular account updated to positive. So that's something I, you know, want you to make note of as well. All right, somebody unmuted, what do we got? You got another question in there? Yeah, I okay. see a couple of comments in here. Who unmuted? Somebody just unmuted. If you would, go ahead and uh, the floor is yours. Ask, ask your question if you have one, or feedback, comment, whatever. It looked like they muted back out, whoever it was, because okay. everybody is muted. Um, also, I see y'all hanging on here. Almost everybody stay on, so I love this. If y'all would like, another um, credit call like this, we're happy to do it. We're happy to do this again, but I need y'all to do me a huge favor in whichever credit group you're in, whether it's credit group one, two, three, four, or five, if you're getting value from this call, make sure you post in the credit group. Y'all should have been on this call tonight. It was amazing, right? Um, Yvette, 
Now, I laughed out loud when I saw your comment. I feel betrayed by Joe Biden. Girl. <laughs> okay, you got to tell us. You got to tell us about this. Why do you feel betrayed? Because that's what he ran on. Like, he going to eliminate the student loans. And see, mine is still in good standing in that good old forbearance. You feel me? And now they finna cut it off. So I got to start paying it. But I'm just saying, I just feel like he could have did more than because that's why I voted for his, you know. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. okay, that's all. But uh, I just need to make more money. That's that's the that's the gist of it. So these loans won't be beat me down when they start back. But that was it. Yeah, because that's what he told us, right? Am I? Am I? Am I? Was I misunderstanding him? He told us. Nope, he I told us that. That's what okay. He yeah. Thank you, Sean. Yeah. Okay. 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 <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of people was banking on that. You know, I did see that some, but it fell into yeah. a certain category. Like it had to be this old and this and that. Certain people did get it removed, whatever the case may be. And who knows, they might use that again to uh support their campaign this time. Like we're gonna do it for real this time, y'all. Don't vote mm -hmm. for me again. You know how they do. But uh yeah, so a lot of people did plan on getting it deleted, but hell. didn't. Yeah, you know better now, huh? Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, fool me twice, you know, and put the blame on you. But yeah, so that has happened. And we mm -hmm. won't speak too much on that, but some people have got it deleted because of whatever uh time frame that it fell in and price amount that it fell in. But a lot of people were still stuck holding the bag. Yes. Now Anisha said um she removed student loans and some balances went down to zero also on student loan report. I have seen that as well. Natalie said he did her student loans decrease by 130000 Yeah, Yeah. Uh, Desmond said it was a certain tax bracket. All of his was removed. So, yeah, different strokes for different folks, y'all. Joe. Um, yeah, I did hear some people celebrating. Joe so. had rules. Joe had rules with it. <laughs> he had rules. Okay, anybody else? Anybody else? I know this call ran long, but. Is it past nine? What time is it? Absolutely it is. It's 925. So oh. we stay on for an hour and a half tonight. So y'all, um, just going forward, make sure you drop any credit questions. Y'all have some really good questions that I know so many other people could learn from this. So if you have any other questions going forward, do not forget, put your questions in the credit group. For my builders, if I can get y'all to stay on just really, really quickly, we're not going to do like a training tonight. This is for my money makers, those who are currently making money in my econ. If you are interested in learning how to make money in my econ, just know it's just a referral-based system. If you know other people who want to fix their credit, get out of debt, buy a home, make money, start investing, improve their finances, money management, everything in my econ is. If you know other people that want any aspect of that, you can refer them to the company, send them your website link for them to join and you get paid. It literally is that simple. Uh, we're not going to do a presentation tonight for like brand new people, but if that's what you are interested in, reach out to us, reach out to your upline, the person who got you started, and we can teach you our process during this $9.95 promotion because you can run a special right now for $9.95 or $0.95 cents if you're really serious about helping other people. So let's talk about it. Reach out to the person who got you started and we can get you in on all of that. Now, if you are not a builder, if you're hanging up at this time, wait, we want you to hear the mission statement. That's wait. right. You see, we live in a world where we're conditioned for failure. And oftentimes we have been programmed or fooled into mediocrity. So people find themselves living like peasants instead of the royalty that they were meant to be. But you see here in the royalty movement, we see the king in you. We see that queen in you from start to finish. It's just time for you to take your seat on the throne because this is where we uplift your character, your confidence, and your cash flow. As royalty, you should establish a solid financial foundation that will soon lead to your abundance and thriving empire. Take your seat on the throne. You are royalty. Salute. Appreciate y'all rocking with us. Yes. Take the information we've given you, apply it, and for the builders, stick around, stay around for a little bit longer. Yeah, real quick for my builders on here, unmute, say money, 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 money. Money, 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 money,
real quick, uh, we're not going to do a, a builder's training because y'all know we did one on Monday. But we just wanted to know if y'all had any questions. LaShondra, if you have anything to say, feel free. But do y'all have any questions? Like, how are you feeling during this promotion? Do you feel like you're struggling in any areas? Let's go ahead and talk about it really quick before we hang up. And in the meantime, while y'all think of y'all questions or whatever the case may be, I want y'all to think, and this don't have to be an exact number, but in the chat, I want y'all to type what your monthly expenses are. What are your monthly expenses? And I'll tell you why I want to know that number. And you can just, you know, you can just round up. For some people, it's 3000 4000 Like, when you calculate all of your monthly expenses, your rent or mortgage, utilities, phone bill, uh, groceries, everything, gas, how much are you typically spending on a per-month basis? For many people, it's under 5000 Some people, I was talking to one of the team members, his was 2700 So it don't matter. Don't feel bad about your number. And the, if it's a low number, that's awesome. You know, if it's high, okay, great. But I just want to see those numbers. And yeah. then I'll get back to why I want to know that number. Now, y'all got any building questions based on what the queen just asked? Unmute, throw it out there, and then we'll get to the numbers later. I see the numbers popping up. Yeah, I do. Go. I have a question. Okay, go ahead, queen. All right. So when you uh, bring in a, a, a new teammate, do you necessarily have to bring them in under you or can you sign them up under one of your other legs, right or left? Okay, okay, so first let me clarify. We do not have right and left legs, okay? That some network marketing companies do, we don't. Um, we personally, we don't do placing, you know, like placing under someone else's account, however, you can do whatever you want to do. For example, because I think this is Natalie, right? It is, and I didn't mean right or left leg. I just said that's my vision of it on how I'm oh. supporting my my growth. That's how I leveled up. So I'm just trying to maximize my leveling. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I definitely understand now. I mean, it's not something that we recommend because honestly, with it being so inexpensive. Ten dollars, you know, even at full price, it's really inexpensive for what right. we offer, and we feel like everybody can do it on their own. Okay, but if it's like you're building up uh, an account for like a kid or mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. like that, feel free, you know, do what you do. Okay, okay. So Great. it wouldn't matter either way it goes, as long as they signed up, it's all good. Got gotcha. yeah. you. Go. Now, the only thing that I would say, like, if you are placing under, you know, like I said, like under one of your kids or something like that. Make sure that you're the one keeping them in the loop, though, that new person. You're the one maybe sending them team training, mm -hmm, getting mm -hmm. them plugged into the group just to make okay. sure they know what's going on. Okay. Got you. Thank you. Yeah, great question. And it makes more sense when it is your children or yeah, you know, your spouse, children. somebody like right in your household versus just somebody you're just trying to, right. you know, you know, just give them something because then they get to expecting it and, you know, mm -hmm. it ain't that. Yeah. You're trying to build a legacy, like you said, and, and level it up. So, that thought process is good, but yeah, definitely yeah, keep really. whoever you bring in in a loop. All right. All right. Great question. Anybody else? And we're going to get to these numbers. I see some a good round. Uh, of numbers. I have a question, but it's about the uh, coupon. Okay. Um. So I guess I was look. I, I was on the training last night with June. So I'm, my understanding is I don't have, I'm not paying up front. I'm just, Record getting a link from my site, and that's what I'm promote. If I want them to do the 95, that's what I would send them for that. Well, here's the thing, Yvette you have two different options. So you can buy the coupon up front if you want to. Do you want me to show you my screen real quick? Yeah, I'm just hollering. I'm yeah, please. No, 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 it's okay. Okay, give me a second. Um, because this is something new. So yeah, you have two different options. If you want to pay the $10 up front for a coupon, um, you can do that. And then of course, you're going to get the $10 back um, on the commission check. But the other option is you can just grab a link and you can send them the link to enroll for 95 cents. But on the flip side, the $9 will come out of your commission check. Okay, so it'll be deducted. So it, it, I mean, it really just depends on how you want your money. Um, so let me get logged in. All right. So when we go here, we go to my account. And when you go to the coupon center, do you see it uh, bottom middle? Yeah, I see it. 
Okay, so when I click on Coupons Manager, it brings you here. This link, you see that link in that box? If you send that link, people can enroll for just 95 cents, but the $9 will be deducted from your commission check. If you want to buy coupons, you just hit where it says buy coupon and check this out. There is a $19 off offer and a $9 off offer. So if you're selling the one with the travel included, if you want to run a promotion on that, you can. And that you could take $19 off. But keep in mind that 19 is coming out of your pocket. That nine is coming out of your pocket. So you'll just put, you know, um, one here. And when you put one, it'll tell you your total purchase is $9. Put in your credit or debit card information. And once you hit buy now, right there, that little button, once you hit buy now, it's going to generate a code. And that code is what you will give. So you remember last week when we were using a promo code gold, and then we started using the, the code apple. Mm -hmm. I don't know how, how uh, Mrs. Stokes did yeah. that. Because the codes that we get when we um, purchase them are like G W two four H Y Q P Z. It's like a whole <laughs> bunch of letters and numbers, but that's the code that you will give. So you will send them your link and say use coupon code, whatever that code is, and then it will deduct it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. I'm glad you showed me that. No problem. Thank you. Okay. I'm good. All right. Anybody else? Is that persona? Yes. Yes. The coupons, you, you really making an investment in your business. If you're buying coupons, y'all hold on one second. Let me stop the recording. Cause it's going to be long.